My father works as a software engineer for Red Hat Incorporated here in North Carolina in Raleigh. A while back, when I was with him at the company's headquarters, I noticed a quote spelled out in large letters on the wall. First, they ignore you. Then, they laugh at you. Then, they fight you. Then, you win. Well, after harnessing the awesome power of Google, I discovered that those were the words of the great Indian social reformer Mahatma Gandhi, and they illustrate an enduring truth. You see, we live in a world that's averse to justice, a world in which fighting for what is good and right and true is often difficult and dangerous. If you really want to change the world, you will be ignored, ridiculed, and resisted. It's only those who find the courage and resolve to stand in the face of adversity who will win in the end. Today, we're going to look at the life of an incredible man, renowned the world over as one of the greatest reformers in human history, known as the Washington of Humanity. And we're going to witness firsthand how an ardent love for humankind and unshakable determination can change the world. The material from this speech is taken from the book A Hero for Humanity by Kevin Belmonte, Christian History Magazine, and BBC History. William Wilberforce was born in August of 1759 in the British port city of Hull. Now, his parents were wealthy merchants, so he grew up fairly privileged, received an expensive early education. Wilberforce was a small, frail child, sickly, plagued by health problems for the rest of his life. But what he lacked in physical size and strength, he made up for with a commanding personality. Little Wilby was a master of eloquence, capable of instantly seizing the attention of any audience. Well, near the end of his teenage years, Wilberforce attended St. John's College in Cambridge and gained instant popularity among his peers. Unfortunately, at around this time, he started to become, well, you know, a college student. Uh, and although he was very gifted intellectually, he was really more interested in partying and gambling than he was in studies. He later recalled, I can never review with humiliation and shame the course I ran at college. However, he scraped by and graduated. But around this time, he became acquainted with William Pitt, a prospective politician who would later become the prime minister and Wilberforce's closest friend, and he decided to cast his lot in politics with him. Well, in 1780, he was elected to Parliament and immediately proved himself an apt politician and a devastating adversary in parliamentary debate. In 1784, he propelled himself to national prominence when he defeated the political establishment at Yorkshire out of nowhere against all odds with that magnificent last-minute speech claiming his position as the representative of the most powerful county in the British Empire. Well, by this point, Wilberforce was, you know, getting pretty used to this, basking in attention, living the good life. Soon, however, something important changed. The next summer, he traveled to Europe with the esteemed scientist Thomas Milman. Now, at this point, Wilberforce himself was a deep religious skeptic, but Milner was a Christian, and they began to discuss their differing viewpoints. Well, this gave way to months of thorough research in debate, and by the end, Milner's arguments, Wilberforce wrote, led to a settled conviction in my mind of the truth of Christianity. Over the next couple years, he renewed a friendship with the Reverend John Newton, a former slave ship owner whom he had known as a child, famous author of the hymn Amazing Grace, who now became his spiritual mentor. Wilberforce eventually became a devout Christian, and his ideas and principles were radically altered. His stinging sarcasm in debate now gave way to civil eloquence, and his lavish lifestyle gave way to one of hard work, academic rigor, and dedication. And the teachings of Christ became the guiding principles behind his future endeavors for humanity. Well, as it turns out, Wilberforce's newfound principles would soon be put to the test. You see, in the 18th century, the institution of slavery was still alive and well in the British Empire, but there was a small minority of abolitionists who were vocally opposed to it. Well, in 1786, one of Wilberforce's colleagues approached him and asked him to present a motion to Parliament calling for the abolition of the slave trade. Now, Wilberforce had been acquainted with some of the cruelties of slavery before, 
But now, his newfound Christian faith gave him a burning desire to fight against what he saw as an insufferable evil. After pondering the question for months, he finally concluded, God Almighty has set before me the great object of the suppression of the slave trade. He immediately delved into research, combing every resource he could find and every ally he could summon for information on the trade, working day in and day out with prominent abolitionists and supporters, working to expose it for its many evils. His friend Pitt, now the Prime Minister, promised his support and Wilberforce decided it was time to take the issue to the House. On May 12, 1789, Wilberforce stood before Parliament and made his case. I confess to you, he said, so enormous, so dreadful, so irremediable did its wickedness appear that my own mind was completely made up for the abolition. A trade founded in iniquity and carried on as this was must be abolished. Let the policy be what it might. Let the consequences be what they would. I from this time determined that I would never rest till I had secured its abolition. He held the floor for four hours. And at the end of his speech, he concluded, Policy is not my principle. There is a principle that is above everything that is political. The principles of justice, the laws of religion, and of God. The nature and all the circumstances of this trade are now laid open to us. We can no longer plead ignorance. It is brought now so directly before our eyes that this house must decide and must justify to all the world the rectitude of the grounds and principles of its decision. His words left the House in stunned silence. Wilberforce and his supporters convinced Parliament to investigate the trade during the following sessions, but when it finally came time to debate and vote on the issue, they suffered a devastating defeat, losing by 75 votes. But Wilberforce was not one to give up. He reintroduced the motion next session. He stood before the house and pleaded for the slaves, crying, Africa, Africa, your sufferings have arrested my heart. Your sufferings no tongue can express, no language impart. He suffered another crushing defeat. For 20 years, Wilberforce fought against the slave trade. He was mocked, ridiculed, threatened, assaulted multiple times. He fought through political turmoil, through the turbulence of war, through discouragement and debilitating illness, year after year, motion after motion, speech after speech, one irrecoverable failure after another. In 1796, he fell into an episode of just grave illness and depression. He was so physically and emotionally exhausted, he considered giving up the cause. But his good friend Newton encouraged him, saying, Thy God, whom thou servest continually, is able to preserve and deliver you. Little by little by little, the abolitionists gained ground. Public support was increasing dramatically. Finally, the fated day came. On the night of February 23rd, 1807, Sir Samuel Romilly stood before the house and declared that Wilberforce would sleep in peace that night, knowing that he had preserved so many millions of his fellow creatures. The entire house stood to its feet, turned to Wilberforce, and let out a thundering cheer. The abolitionists roared to victory, 283 votes to 16. Wilberforce sat in his chair, bowed his head, and wept. He would continue to fight slavery throughout the rest of his life, eventually beginning a movement to free all remaining slaves in the empire. While old age and illness eventually forced him to hand the reins over to his younger colleagues, he continued to support them to the end, and in 1833, a gravely ill Wilberforce was informed that they had won. The slaves were free. He died three days later. Believe it or not, there's an immense multitude of other accomplishments Wilberforce made in his lifetime that we can't even mention here. Following his death, the Reverend William Jay said that Wilberforce was great among the good and good among the great. 
is disinterested, self-denying, laborious and unceasing efforts in the cause of justice and humanity will call down the blessing of millions and ages yet to come will glory in his memory. Now I'll leave you with this. Take a lesson from William Wilberforce. Never hesitate for a moment to stand for what is good and just and true. When they ignore you, and they will, shout louder. When they laugh, push harder. When they fight you, fight back and in time with fierce determination and the blessings of God, victory is sure.